hub of the blue economy. It's where all our productivity occurs, it's where our ports and harbours are, it's where we go fishing, it's where humans interact with the ocean. It's where humans interact with the ocean. <laughs> and this one's for John. <laughs> Anyone remembers the um, America's Cup? This is in New Zealand, Team New Zealand in the quarterfinals. Unfortunately, the coastal ocean is becoming increasingly impacted. So it's where society meets the ocean, and it's where all our impacts are being felt. Where's my stick? This one here was an east coast low that hit Sydney, Australia's biggest city, in July last year, June last year. Okay, so that's on the swimming pools just being washed into the ocean. That was one storm that lasted three days. Harmful algal blooms, invasive species, this is central stephanus, which is eating all the kelp. We've got the worst coral bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef ever in history have occurred in the last couple of years. And of course, you know, ships run aground. We saw some classic examples in some of the um, slides yesterday. So, the coastal ocean is where we meet, where people meet the ocean, is where operational needs are the greatest. And I love this slide from um, the group here, so I borrowed that, that image there. So, Australia's Integrated Marine Observing System. <coughs> We use it to observe the coastal ocean. Ten years ago, 15 years ago, the federal government said, here's, here's $50 million, go observe the ocean. So it was a very different approach to the United States. In the United States, all these observing efforts grew from the ground up, whereas in Australia we'd had no money to do this kind of sustained observations before. So the government gave us the money and then we had to argue for a year and a half on how we were actually going to spend it. But gradually the community got organised. Right, slow down. We came together and we wrote a series of node plans. So we divide ourselves into nodes, so state-based nodes. And this is my node, New South Wales Minos. They were state-based because that's how we're going to get co-investment from industry and from state agencies and the, the government. We wrote node plans, so we have a big document, it's 200 um, words, pages long, you can read it. And um, it describes the science investment into our observing program. But the money itself funds facilities. And this is a nice example, or a nice way of doing it for countries that don't have a lot of money. So we have one glider facility, we have one radar facility, um, we have an AUV facility, deep water mooring facility, ships of opportunity, Argo float facility. There are 11 different facilities and all the money flows to those facilities. So we're not repeating our efforts. So the glider program, the centralised glider program run in Perth, they distribute the gliders around the country, but the science is governed by the individual nodes. So it's a nice example. So we're not setting up glider groups all over the country in competition with each other. Australia is a country as big as the United States. We only have 25 million people. So it's a very small population and not a lot of money. So the, one of the core tenets of the program is that the data, the data is freely available to everybody. Um, so it's discoverable. Um, it's discoverable on this website here, the aodn.org.au. So if there's anything in the presentation that you like the look of, you can go and get the data, you can play with it, you can do whatever you want with it. And there's been a step change in the amount of data that's collected. This is time, and these are temperature records going along. This is the start of IMOS. You can see that step change in the number of observations. And also this is temperature with depth here as well. So before the observations were just in the surface, and now they're all the way down through the um, water column. Last year we had 209 organisations accessing the data and half of them were international. So this is the New South Wales example. So this is my playground, the East Australian Current, the Western Boundary Current, and South Pacific or South Tropical Diet. Comes down the coast to about 30 degrees south and then separates off, forming the Tasman Front. As it separates, large cyclonic and anticyclonic eddies are shed, and we have this um, warming, uh, this extension here that heads down to Tasmania. The waters of Tasmania are warming at the fastest rate on Earth. It's four times the global average, um, at about a rate of two degrees over the past century. So we have 70 years of temperature data that shows these oceans are warming. So how are we going to observe this incredible ocean with only a small amount of money? So we designed our ocean observing system to have a network, a combined network of deep water moorings, high frequency coastal radar, Autonomous gliders coming down the coast, some gliders out into the big mesoscale eddies, and then a, um, subsets across Harbour, Sydney, 
and a room up where we actually put in coastal shelf moorings. And there's these guys here in 50, 70, and 100 metres. This one's out to 140 metres. So in the coastal program, our deepest mooring is at 140 metres depth. We also have right, wave rider boys here. So this is a weirer system and a wave rider boy underneath. So I'm going to go into each one of these infrastructures in a, in a little more detail, but that's how it all fits together. So this is the program that I lead. Um, I've been responsible for the deployment of moorings along the New South Wales coast. I have a team of technical staff, postdocs and students working on all the data. So we have three moorings here off Coffs Harbour in northern New South Wales, Sydney and Naruma. Um, we're measuring temperature and velocity every five minutes, every eight metres through the water column for the last ten years. That is an incredible resource. When I did my PhD, I had you know, 30 data points and I wrote a whole PhD on it. And now look at this. It's just the most incredible data set. So we have velocity, ADCP sits on the bottom, measures velocity through the water column, the mist just um, down, temperature sensors through the water column as well. And these are my guys out deploying one of our moorings. And you can see we've got four or five knots of current. Some of them have surface expressions, but most of them don't because of that current there. It's way too strong to hold up a surface float. So what are we doing with the data? So we're looking at it in all sorts of different ways. So this is an example of 12 months of data, temperature, velocity, along shore, across shore. Blue is out of the page, um, red is into the page. So polewood, northwood, greatwood, and then across shore, off, offshore, onshore. And then this is our temperature data. And this is down to 100 metres depth. Um, so you can see it's highly variable. So we've got two knots or four knots, two metres a second going south, and then two metres a second going north. I mean, that's kind of an incredible um, region. So that's up here. We've got the East Australian current coming down the coast that separates off. It's more variable down off Sydney, but also um, not as strong. So we're trying to understand the dynamics of the region. We're looking at the impact of the current on driving upwelling through the bottom boundary layer. This result here is quite nice. We were able to look at all the upwelling events driven by the current. So we've got an onshore bottom boundary layer transport driven by the polewood current. And what we were able to see is there is a direct correlation between the strength of the current and the onshore transport. And we also see a temperature gradient response with that. Now, if you think about why would we care, what we want to know is what's the impact of the physics on the productivity? So from physics to fish. So if I can sit in my lab and know the strength of the current going south, and I can see that from remote sensing, perhaps. Can I estimate the temperature gradient? Can we take it a step further? And can we actually look at the phytoplankton response? So we're looking at the phytoplankton here associated with the different water masses, and we see that there are different phytoplankton associated with upwelling than with downwelling. So maybe we can get to the point where we can observe remotely and understand the phytoplankton response. If you know that, do you know what the, the number of fish is going to result in? So that's the goal there, the physics to fish concept. Um, so we're working hard to understand those dynamics using our moored temperature data. Another platform that we use is the autonomous gliders. We talked about these br briefly yesterday. I just want to point out that these guys here, the slocum gliders, are shallow gliders. So this is the kind of dive depth that we do. They go down to a depth of about 200 metres, and their missions are three to four weeks, so much shorter in duration than the gliders we talked about yesterday. But they dive every hour or so, or 30 to 40 minutes. So we get a vertical profile down, we get a vertical profile up, two in 40 minutes, and continually along the east coast of Australia. So what does the data look like? As I said, in a western boundary current, you can't do an endurance line. You can't just send a glider out for three months and hope it comes back to the same spot. You'll never see it again. So we chose to go very north, and then run the glider down the coast. So it comes down the coast. Sometimes it gets caught up in sub scale features, um, and we pick them up when the battery is running low. And this is some of the data we get. It's temperature, salinity, density, chlorophyll. And you can see the water is getting deeper, so offshore, shallower, onshore, offshore, onshore, offshore, onshore. So it's doing these zigzags here. And what you see is that as the the East Australian current comes down the coast here, it separates off, gets caught up in that sub scale feature, the productivity increases. Okay, so um, temperature goes down, chlorophyll goes up. So it's a really nice way of getting a holistic approach to understand some of the features. So what have we done with the data? We've had more than 30 missions now along the east coast of Australia. And here um, you can see these are all the glider tracks. We've gridded them all, and the colour represents the depth. 
We gridded them in a longshore and the across shore direction. And these big numbers here, 10, 11, 3, they represent the number of gliders going through every grid box. The little numbers below it, 4,900, 2,000, 4,000, that's the number of CTD profiles that we've got in each box from the gliders. We've, we've collected over 50,000 new CTD profiles in this particular region of the country. Just an incredible resource. And I only had to go out on a boat once. <laughs> <That was laughs> I used to love going to sea, but then I got really seasick, and that's the end for me. So what we're also able to do, as I said yesterday, you can estimate the current strength based on the drift of the glider. Um, so the drift, you can't measure it, you can only measure its position at the surface, but you know the difference in that position between one dive and the next, and so you can ex estimate the drift. So these are all the current velocities from the gliders. These are our moored um, velocities from the moorings, so you can see that they line up pretty well. And these are our altimetric velocities, so you can see that the altimetry is not getting the separation of the jet very cleanly, whereas the gliders clearly show this intensification and separation. And this is the first data set we were able to collect where we could actually resolve all the terms uh, in the depth average momentum balances, so the longshore terms, the, the nonlinear terms. So that was a really nice piece of work that we were able to use the glider data for. Another thing we have once we grid it, we have our sea surface temperature, but everyone can get sea surface temperature, right? That's no big deal. We have bottom temperature. Not everyone can get bottom temperature, and for some things, that's really important. So we have temperature through the water column. We also have the bottom temperature. This is our you can see the temperature gradient upstream of the EAC separation point compared to downstream. The waters downstream of the separation point are a lot colder, and it's um, associated with upwelling, dri driven by the separation of the jet. So then what did we do with it? We gridded it all up, and we gave it all away. We said anyone can come and use these data sets. So we, this is our gridded data, all the profiles and we published it in a journal um, that takes scientific data, nature scientific data, and it's a data descriptor paper describing all the, the data, all the NetCDF files are there, and even examples of how to access the NetCDF files. So if you're not familiar with this journal, I really recommend it, because lots of people are doing this these days. Everyone's trying to give their data away. It's almost a race to see whose data can get the most citations. So it's kind of cool. Um, so we're really proud of that effort. The next question is, what do you do next? Do you keep doing this forevermore in the context of sustained observing, or do you move on? You know, we've done it for five years. Big country, this is only three or 400 kilometres of coastline. So that's the question we're grappling with at the moment. One of the other things we like to do is public outreach. So we, we'll get our publicity where we can, and if people think that we're using the data and we're making a meaningful contribution, um, we will. So. In our state, we've had a problem with sharks, great white sharks. About once a year, someone gets attacked or eaten or interacts with a shark, but the government thinks this is a huge problem and it seems to be scaring tourists away, and that becomes a very big problem. So they've started tagging sharks, so they put a satellite tag on them, and when they go past a listening post, they tweet their location. And this is a series of tweets. Um, <laughs> These are sharks tweeting. Um, DPI Fisheries advised tagged bull shark detected at Main Beach Amber um, at two in the afternoon, and so on and so on and so on. My guys are out that day deploying a glider. So I tweeted, hope the glider we deployed at Yamber doesn't get nibbled by a bull shark. So the guy in Perth tweeted back, seems like a problem with the fin. We're trying to sort it out. I tweeted back to Perth, that's where the glider facility is. What? Have we lost a wing? Well, there's... Oops. Where are we? So he said, it's, it's been restarted and it's diving again. At this stage, it's been watched closely. I actually find Twitter is a really good way of getting real-time information, and it's also a nice echo chamber, so I only associate with people who agree with my views. It's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> anyway, we got our glider back. We had to go and recover it. And you can see the entire rudder's been eaten off. It's got shark bites all over it. Um, this is 30 centimetres. <laughs> Big jaw marks. And very, very deep in the casing. So we use our public outreach um, where we can. So holy moly, the shark got our glider. So we got a few responses, and people are very interested in the fact that the sharks are attacking the glider. And that's why I said yesterday, Mythbusters said yum, yum, yellow. 
Anyway, another tool we use is surface currents um, from high-frequency radar, or high-frequency radar to assess and measure and monitor surface currents. This is a map of the United States, and these are the locations that um, have had or do still have high-frequency coastal radar. This is an incredible resource, which, in my opinion, should be utilised more than it is. Um, and you can see in San Francisco, you've got six kilometre res resolution currents coming down to one kilometre resolution currents coming down to 500 metre resolution in San Francisco Bay. Around Australia, we're not so lucky, but we do have one system up off northern New South Wales, which my team are responsible for. So we chose to deploy the Weira system. It's a phased array. Um, so we have a line of 12 receivers um, and four antennas, uh, transmitters. It sends out a sound, sound wave, and what's reflected back, you can use it two different sites, and by triangulation, you get the radial velocity of the, the current in each, at each point. You can triangulate and estimate the surface velocities. This is what it looks like. Um, this is the radar system, the computational system itself. It sits inside a shipping container in a caravan park at the beach. Um, it's not so bad, OK? And we use the word donga in Australia. That's a donga. Anyway, <laughs> you've learnt some Australian. So what are we doing with this data? Um, we've now got five years of high-frequency data. This is um, 100 kilometre range and 100 kilometre on the longshore, one kilometre resolution. So it's really high-resolution coastal um, surface data. Um, so this is what the mean looks like in this particular region, the mean currents. Um, so I've got this smart guy working with me, Matt Archer, who came from Florida, and he's worked out a way to transform the velocities into flow-following coordinates. And so you can get the average profile um, in geographic coordinates, which is this, is our, ge our geographic, our mean velocity in geographic coordinates, but that's aliased by the meandering of the jet. It moves onshore and offshore every 30 to 60 days. So if you transform it into flow following coordinates, you actually get the strength of the jet at each time step, and you can see that you know, surface velocities of, on average, of 1.4 metres a second coming down the coast. And with that, you can actually get a time series of meandering of the current on and off the shelf. So this black line is the core of the jet. Um, and this is, I can't even read how many degrees that is, half a degree or something. So there are times when the current's well offshore, onshore, offshore, onshore. You can see that meandering. And one of the things we want to do is develop operational products. So if you're a ship going north, you don't want to be going straight into one and a half metres a second of current. So if we can develop an operational product that says this is the core of the jet in real time, they can move offshore or inshore. And we can um, sort of produce daily maps of the width of the jet, the maximum or minimum velocities. Conversely, if you're going south, you want to be in that jet because you're going to save a lot of fuel, right? So this is the kind of thinking we've got. The other thing we can do is... Um, resolve small-scale features. So here we have a small-scale cyclonic eddy. Now, I don't want to get in a Rosby number competition with the previous speakers, but we've got Rosby numbers of 0.6 to 1.9. I mean, that's pretty cool. So we're getting... <laughs> it's going to sound like a dork here. And we're getting uplift of 55 metres in 24 hours. So these small-scale cyclonic features um, are highly dynamic. They're They've got, um, this is a picture of chlorophyll here. They've got upwelling at the leading edge and downwelling at their trailing edge. And again, another dork moment. Um, we got on the cover of JGR, so that's like being on Time magazine for me. So <laughs> that was kind of cool. But the, the best thing you can do is put it all together. So you bring, I wonder if I can do this. Have I got a mouse? Can't do it. So it's a map of sea surface temperature, our HF radar velocities, and somewhere in there, I think there's a glider coming through. Ooh, and off it goes, OK? So you bring it all together. We've got the moorings. They sit in here. We've got the glider coming down the coast, and we've got the HF radar. And we can un This is a static view for those of you that missed it. There's the glider coming down here and the two moorings. We can start to understand the productivity, the current-driven upwelling. So glider offshore, onshore, et cetera. High... Um, backscatter, where there's upwelling, and then high chlorophyll concentrations in the surface waters. So bringing it all together, you get a much better view of the system. So that's all well and good, but we also need to model our coastal ocean. So we're doing our bit to downscale from the global ocean model, so we use Blue Link, which is the Australian operational product, has boundary conditions, 
we're trying to understand our bit, bit of the coast, so this is our three-kilometre grid. And then we downscale here to a 750-metre resolution grid and right all the way into Sydney Harbour. Um, I don't know if these animations are... So that's our 750-metre grid, and you can start to see all these small-scale features on the inshore edge of the East Australian current. Um, and these are our mooring locations that we use to validate the model with. Um, so these are free-running models, which are not as good as data assimilating models. So, and we're going to get lots of lectures on data assimilation itself, so I'm not going into the mechanics of it at all. Suffice to say that we are actually using data assimilation. So this here represents all the Argo floats in a two-year period in our domain. And these are all the observations in the two-year period that we assimilated, so our HF radar observations, our deep water moorings. Sorry, I didn't mention the deep water moorings. I mentioned them yesterday, so we have this full um, five-kilometre depth transport resolving array up here that costs millions of dollars. Um, our radar system, we've got XBT lines that I mentioned yesterday, and then we've got gliders coming down the coast. That's sort of examples of the data we're assimilating. And these are all the data points. Blue is our satellite data, so there's lots of that, obviously. We've got Argo, um, gliders, HF radar, XBT, New South Wales coastal moorings and the deep moorings. So you can see that at times we've got lots of SST and that's about it. And then you can also see at other times we've got gliders that have been deployed. So this green here is the gliders um, coming out offshore. So we've assimilated all that data and we want to know how good our model is. So as an example, this is a correlation with our surface HF radar currents. So the currents from the model correlated with the surface currents from the HF radar without assimilation. It's a free-running model. Correlation's fairly low. With assimilation, the correlation is one. Now, it's not quite a fair comparison because the data are assimilated, but if it wasn't one, you'd be kind of worried. So what it's saying is that the model is doing a really good job of reproducing the surface flow in the regions where we're assimilating the data. So if you want a, a more fair comparison, this is our sea surface height, and this is our RMS difference. So after assimilation, we've really reduced the error. So the assimilation is doing a good job of reproducing the features that we find um, important. But why do we do this? Well, we want to understand the small-scale features, of course. So here's an example of one of those small cyclonic features. Um, this is the observations here. So you've got the current, warm current coming down the coast, a small cyclonic feature. It's been picked up in the HF radar. It's not picked up in a VSO, right? So those um, coarse observations don't even come into the coast, right? So this is one of the problems. The coastal ocean is really hard to observe remotely and um, passively. So these are our velocities that we assimilate into our model. So these are our actual velocities that we're assimilating. So we've got poleward velocities and equatorward velocities as observed by the HF radar. This is our forecast without data assimilation. And you see the currents just coming down the coast. There's no, there's no sign of that feature. And this is our sea surface height without assimilation. But once we assimilate it, these are the, um, the velocities that we get in observation space. And these are the velocities in, well, they're both the same velocities, but this is in model space. And you can see that we've, picked, we've assimilated that cyclonic feature into the eddy. And all of a sudden, you can see that sea level depression. So it's actually really cool. So we're using assimilation to resolve really high resolution features. And now we can use um, the, the results to actually understand the dynamics. So the next thing we want to do is understand how impactful are your observations. Is it worth going out on a boat? Is it worth deploying a glider? Is it worth putting in a transport resolving array? So these are all the observations we assimilated, and we chose a metric of transport. We want to understand transport at various latitudes along the coast of Australia. This is the example of Sydney at 34 degrees south. and We want to understand how each of these observations contributes to our understanding of velocity, sorry, of transport um, through a cross-section. So we put in that multi-million dollar transport array, which is this one, the five kilometre full depth transport resolving array. And we can see that at times it has a major impact. So what it's doing is it's changing the transport by four sphere drips. So the presence of those observations in the model says we're changing our transport estimates by four sphere drips. But at times it's having no impact at all, you know, virtually no impact. 
So we have to now go back and look at the dynamics at that time and understand what was going on at that time that having that transport resolved made such a difference in the model fields. Another example is the glider. So here are all our glider observations. We sent it out into an EAC eddy, and it has a really significant impact on the transport estimates. And so, it, to some extent, we put in the transport resolving array, this mooring array, um, where the current is most coherent, because we wanted to be able to measure it across the whole width of the current. But if it's really coherent, maybe the boundary conditions of the model are already getting it right, and maybe you don't need to measure it at all, because you, know, you can get it with satellite, and it's coherent, and it's not really a problem. Maybe putting your gliders into EAC eddies, mesoscale eddies, is far more impactful. So getting the, the subsurface hydrography right is far more important, potentially, because it puts the eddies in the right spot, it gives us those subsurface observations that we don't have, and perhaps it's actually more useful and far more cost-effective than um, a really full-depth transport resolving array. But you have to bear in mind, it depends what question you're trying to ask. So in this case, the question we're asking was, what's transport through Sydney? The question wasn't, how is that transport changing over a 100-year period, for example? You know, so if that's the question you're asking, maybe the transport array is far more significant, because it's actually the mooring array itself is going to give you that, that answer. But it, for my purposes, if we want to understand transport with this metric, this glider is actually really impactful. So we touched on this a little bit yesterday. But I think we really need to consider when we're going out and observing the ocean, you need to consider the full cycle, right? So you take your ocean observations, you use your numerical model, you assimilate the data, you understand the observation impact, and then you go back and you observe more smartly, okay? So you assess your array, you, you change your observing system based on all the information you've gathered. And if we don't do that, we're just going to keep throwing money into the ocean forevermore. And while it sounds fun, there isn't a limitless pool of money. So I think it's really important to consider that cycle and go back and change or alter your observing strategy based on the information that you've obtained. So I want to give an example of using oceanography for operational purposes, seeing that was all research, um, and we're at a school for operational oceanography. So the example I want to give is marine heat waves. Who's ever heard of a marine heat wave? Wow, that's cool. OK, so this is some work we're doing right now. Um, who lives in a hot country? No one. <laughs> a few people. <laughs> What's an atmospheric heat wave? It's defined as a prolonged period of time, five days in the atmosphere, of temperature above a certain threshold, usually defined as the 90th percentile. Sorry, three days. So atmospheric heat waves, prolonged temperature period, um, elevated temperature for a prolonged period. In the ocean, we define it as five days. So we use a temperature anomaly above the 90th percentile for a five-day period. And here are some examples um, of sea surface temperature along the east coast of Australia. And I did say um, the area has been warming faster than anywhere else on Earth. That's the trend in warming. But we also have these sporadic heat waves that become very, very warm. So, we used an operational data set. Sydney Water Corporation, who are the company that are responsible for our offshore transport of sewage, so they take sewage and they pump it out into the ocean, have to deploy a mooring off the coast, and have done for the last 20 years, to look at the stratification through the water column so we can understand the dispersion of the plume. So they've been monitoring the ocean for 20 years. I mean, I was still in primary school then. And so, this is the data they've given us. So from 1990, all the way through to 2015. And this is temperature through the water column at eight metre intervals. That in and of itself is a remarkable resource. But with that, um, we combined it with 60 years of hydrographic sampling where people went out on a boat and sampled the water temperature through the water column once a week in the first 30 years and then once a month. And we're able to generate a climatology of temperature this in and of itself is interesting because the climatology shows the warmest surface waters occur in April, which is autumn or fall, and the, cool, the warmest bottom waters occur in the middle of winter. So just that result is interesting. So the biology is experiencing upwelling in summer, so the bottom water is colder, and just no upwelling in winter, so the bottom water is warmer. Anyway, with that climatology, we can then calculate our percentiles, so our extremes, our 10th percentile and our 90th percentile. So here we have our time series, here we have our climatology, 
And here we have our 90th percentile. And these here are the marine heat waves. These are the periods of time when the water temperature exceeds the 90th percentile. So this one is prolonged, so for a prolonged period of time. So this is the first study to go and look at marine heat waves through the entire water column. Previously, people had only have used sea surface temperature because you can get it from satellite. So we've got 30 years of satellite data. We can measure the sea surface temperature and we can calculate the, um, the climatology and then the variation from that climatology. But we were able to use the water column, full water column um, information to characterise these heat waves. And what we showed was that their duration and their intensity, this is their intensity, and this is depth, right? They're more intense at depth. And so that's important. The intensity is greatest below the thermocline, and that was never observed from the satellite. You just don't get that piece of information. OK, so they, they last longer, there are more of them, and they're more intense at depth. So one of the key results was that sea surface temperature underestimates the intensity and the duration. So why do we care about that? Good question. If you're in the aquaculture business, potentially you care. OK? So the example of salmon farming, it's highly lucrative globally. Chile, Norway, really, really intensive salmon farming. Perhaps not so smartly, Australia and New Zealand thought, we want to get in on that game. But we're in a western boundary current, and the western boundary currents are warming. It's worth $550 million a year to my country. I mean, that's a lot of money. And yet, these salmon are experiencing marine heat waves events. In Chile, 4.5 billion. In New Zealand, 50 to 60 million, and that's an old number. Salmon can't regulate their body temperature. So they need water temperatures of 12 to 17 degrees. But increasingly, we're getting marine heat waves and prolonged periods of time where the water is above 18 degrees. This is catastrophic for the salmon. They, they become sick, they don't eat, they can't metabolise, and they become impacted by disease or affected by disease. So large numbers of them die. And I'll also point out that they sit in these pens that are 24 metres deep. So the temperature they might be measuring at the surface may not be indicative of the extremes that are being experienced um, down at depth. And they can't get out. They're in cages, obviously, so that predators can't get them and so the fish don't escape. So considerations for the aquaculture industry, you know, what are the long-term temperature trends? Are the marine heat waves increasing in frequency or duration or intensity? What's the implication of the subsurface intensification? And how long is too long? It depends what you are. If you're phytoplankton, Maybe two days is too long. If you're salmon, maybe 10 days is too long. If you're salmon and the water temperature increases, you don't eat. And that impacts the farmers, because they've bought all this food, and then the fish don't eat. So that's cost them money just there, even if they're not dying. So understanding this information is really important. So the last little section I wanted to talk about was bringing operational ocean information to industry, because it's the operational oceanography um, course. So I put it to you that we really need long-term observations of the hydrodynamics, the temperature and the currents, the waves, we're going to hear more about that, to understand the trends, the impacts and the drivers of these things. We need access to data that already exists. So that 20-year data set that was collected by you know, our state water company was so valuable in the study we did. And there are plenty of these data sets out there, and it's about liberating them and putting them out on the internet so people can access them and do really cool research. We need real-time data for immediate operations and for monitoring. We need short-term forecasts on the weather timescales of one to seven days. And in the salmon example, if you know your salmon's not going to eat next week, you would order less food. That's important. And we need our seasonal forecasts, two weeks to nine months, if you know it's going to be a hot summer versus a cold summer, so we can maximise our impacts and... Um, sorry, minimise the impacts and maximise our opportunities. And, of course, we need the climate forecast to future-proof the industries. The final thing we need are smart data delivery tools. It's all very well me having this information on my laptop, but how do I get it out to industry? So we also need our data assimilating models, so combining the modelling with the observations. So we've got a project in New Zealand right now which is building our very first coastal forecasting capability. We're not there yet, we're only just starting, but hopefully we'll have a New Zealand flag up on that Kadei map of the world um, sometime soon. And we're also building operational tools to deliver information. So users of ocean information can click on their favourite part of the world and come up with some sort of forecast. And then we can put in thresholds. This is the wave um, height, and this is their operational threshold. And you can say, you know, 
da 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 da, work, 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 happy, happy. Oh dear, you know, we need to shut down, okay? So having these thresholds um, identified in information, in ways that are easy for industry to understand. You know, these people in industry, they're very, very smart. If you give them the information they need, they will be able to um, grab hold of it and actually work more smartly. And this is that same example there. So I think it's really important, and someone, I think, I think Simone mentioned it earlier today, you've got your R&D providers, um, you've got government agencies, the service providers and in industry, and we need to be talking more as well. So, you know, trying to get that research directly. Can we go straight across through here or through here? What's that network? How do we get our research into industry? You know, we only discovered these marine heat waves last year, and already industry is starting to think about marine heat waves. So that's a really quick sort of uptake of the concepts um, into industry. So we really need to be mindful of that for operational purposes. So in summary, the coastal ocean is where it's all at for industry, and it's becoming highly impacted. We're observing the coastal ocean in networks of observational arrays. We're modeling it. We're assimilating the data into our models. And we're trying to apply the information in an operational context, and then delivering the data in a way that's understandable for industry. So I would like to thank all my team who've contributed to this. It's by no means my own work. It's the work of many, many people in my team. And thank you for listening. As you deploy the gliders and uh, deploy the instruments in the ocean, see? So do you have any problems or challenges with the issue that somebody take it and put it somewhere or steal it or yeah. make a damage or anything? We, Touchwood, have not had that problem. I have a colleague in New Zealand who deployed a glider and three hours later she was on her way home and a fisherman picked it up thinking it was lost. <laughs> so we've never had one stolen. Um, she's had one retrieved. Um, so then they just did press releases before the next one and said, this is going in the ocean, please leave it there. But I know there's, there's problems. I've had trouble with vandalism in other countries where I've worked. Yeah, because it's happened to um, one of our gliders. So we have like wave glider. And then after three days in the South China Sea, so <laughs> it's uh, sent a signal. So it turns out it's be on the fisherman boat. Yeah, it's so that's really cool. If your equipment satellite tracked, which a lot of ours is, we've gone and picked it up from people's backyards and sheds and stuff. But yeah. it's not usually stolen per se. It's usually yeah. something that's drifting. Um, drifters are a good example of things that get picked up, but our floats, our moorings are all satellite tracked now, and we have been able to retrieve them. But I don't think they're stealing them. They're just trying to be helpful. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> what would they do with them? Yeah. Thank you.